I know the property sector have agreed to collaborate uh, and there's some interesting developments underway. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about those mm -hmm. and um, how other sectors might learn from your experience. Um, so thanks for having me here today. It's really good to, to see so many people who are um, interested in this topic. Um, our journey in this space started in a room not too dissimilar from this a couple of years ago. In, in fact, it was in the same building. So I think, uh, I think Stockland hosted our Hall of Mirrors conversation where we had, um, I guess, representatives from sustainability of our... Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. My I know thing your isn't mics. working. Um, it's, you just need to speak into this one as well. Sure. Thank okay. <laughs> Clearly not loud enough. Okay. Um, so we, uh, so I'll backtrack a second. Um, the role of a good industry association, I think, is to is to challenge its members uh, around you know uh, issues that are that are either on the horizon um, or that we think they should be thinking about. Um, the property sector has a really long running and sort of long held uh, spirit of collaboration around sustainability. So we convene a national sustainability roundtable that comprises the heads of sustainability of all of our big members. Uh, and we've been, I think, incredibly successful uh, over time at driving, uh, I think, a lot of ambition and success around environmental sustainability. So your Green Star, Neighbours, all of that. Um, I think we were pretty late to the party on social sustainability. So it's been the intention of the Property Council to really try and push that conversation. Um, modern slavery uh, is, is obviously a really important part of that. So a couple of years ago, I think when the parliamentary inquiry was just sort of getting running and I was chatting to people like Robin and Jenny Stanger in the room as well, which I think you were part of that first session that we ran. Um, we pulled reps from sustainability, risk, procurement, legal councils all into a room and it was a, do you even know what like modern slavery is? Um, are you aware that there could be legislation? Uh, what are you doing about it? And there were lots of like, you know, like, holy shit, you know, sorry, I'm going <laughs> to, permission to swear. Permission to speak frankly. Um, lots of worried faces in the room all looking at each other going, oh my God, I've got no idea what we're going to do in this space. And that was it from that point in time when everyone else in the room could see everyone else equally freaked out um, about the situation. I think a lot of people took comfort in that. And, and it wasn't too long uh, before everyone realised, well, we can go back to our offices and come out with, you know, uh, our own plans on how to do this, but actually, as soon as you go to the first level of my supply chain, and hey, they're all the same people, so um, you're going to impose your 10-point plan on your part of the supply chain, which is the same supply chain as the person sitting next to you, and isn't that a horribly inefficient um, uh, way of going about things? So. I think given we already had a bit of a culture of collaboration in this space, um, there was pretty quick agreement that we should be doing something together. Um, so I think initially um, that conversation was really focused around building the understanding of the issue and what the legislation was going to mean for the sector. So we, I think, um, you know, with very I think generous participation from the supply chain school, from experts like Jenny Stanger in the room, um, who was at the Salvation Army at the time. Um, well, I was, you know, very focused on getting a perspective from civil society groups and people like Jenny who um, worked in this space for a really long time uh, and could provide a perspective that, you know, people within property just just didn't have. So. Uh, so a lot of education, uh, a lot of navel gazing for a time, and um, uh, so so we had a working group that uh, basically focused on the legislation for a little while. Um, we all agreed that we should be strongly supportive of it, um, and we, to the extent that you know, we we started and did, um, we we partnered with some of the. Uh, the other kind of uh, community groups in that space to advocate for an independent anti-slavery commissioner, uh, which, you know, that amendment didn't get up, but um, next that time. next time, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that work wasn't for nothing and, and that's still there. Um, but it gave, us a, it gave us a kind of regular platform for discussion and one of the, I guess, the early opportunities that came up in discussion was around 
you know, like what does that initial engagement with suppliers look like? Every, everyone does prequal questionnaires, like that's just a common practice. It's done for health and safety, it's done for sustainability more broadly. Um, everyone was going to be integrating questions on modern slavery into that. Um, so, the, so the thought bubble at the time was, could we look at doing that together? rather than creating um, a mountain of compliance burden on, on you know, um, tier one and two suppliers by pushing 20 slightly similar versions of the same questionnaire separately onto our supply chain, wouldn't that be a really obvious thing to just do that together and use the same thing and try and uh, use a bit of technology and make it, you know, use one of those online platforms to do it. So. That's, um, that's what we've been doing um, in the early stages. I'd, I'd say our collaboration goes uh, beyond that. So we're also looking at other things we can be doing together as a sector. So um, that's in its early phase of scoping out. We're looking at some research around remediation responses, around training for people in our, in, in our members' organisations and other things. Thank you, Frankie. Um, deep in Deepens from Transurban, who one of ISCA's uh, long-standing members and friends. Um, Deepen from an organisational perspective, what are you seeing in terms of the importance of integration, but also perhaps also building on Frankie's observations around collaboration? Thanks for that. And I guess, first of all, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, but it's also important for me to say that we are very much, I would say, the early stages of our journey in this space. Um, but it's an it's a exciting time to be doing this. And I guess um, I reflect back on, on my 15 plus years in procurement. And this is the most exciting time to be in this part of, of the procurement field. So I feel like it's an absolute privilege and honour to be able to do work where you can actually make a real impact in people's lives on the ground. Um, not just get kind of caught in the rat race of deal making and typical procurement type work. So it's a, it's a really amazing kind of time to be in this, in this industry and in this kind of function. Can I just have a quick show of hands from the room? Who in their respective organisations has already started their work on modern slavery or who has it actually not? So maybe hands up for who has. It's probably about half or more than half the room. Um, so I'll probably maybe skip through some of the stuff in terms of um, influence and integration, but I guess a, a couple of basic points. The, the morning sessions, for those of you that were here, covered a lot of really good points. There were some excellent points made by, um, by a number of people from, from the property group. Uh, and we've actually largely followed a lot of those steps ourselves at Transurban. But a couple of things I would say is that th this is seen as a very, very important piece of work from a Transurban group point of view. Uh, and it's, it's obviously the legislation has played a big role in that. But we fundamentally see it as, as, as this work is strengthening the communities that we operate in. So it's actually core to the vision of the group. Um, but we started with, and, and I just want to quickly dovetail into what's important and why we focused on this. We started with the hearts and minds approach with this because, and, and I think Robin raised it before, is that we should never forget the human impact of, of this work. Uh, and that's really important because ultimately in a large organisation, and Transurban, to give you some context, you know, we have over 2,000 employees across uh, three countries, um, five operating regions. We spend close to $1.9 billion a year across approximately 1,600 vendors. It's a complex business. Uh, and, and a complex business like ours has a complex series of challenges they need to deal with every single day of the week. So the Modern Slavery Act and the work in this space is very important, but is one of many other things that an average you know, business owner has to deal with on any given day. So for that, to get cut through and to make sure that people always understand that, we're focused on the hearts and minds as a starting point, as, the, as, the, as a bedrock of what we wanted to, to um, start our program with. And this is going back about 18 months ago when we kicked off our program. Uh, and we've always stuck tr true to those principles. And we want to be a really strong player in this space because we see it as, a, as our duty, I guess, in terms of our, um, our, space, um, our, our space in the you know, infrastructure industry. So with that, um, the hearts and minds approach is really important for us. The other thing, a couple of things that I think has been important to the success so far of our program is that we've kept it pretty tight in terms of an integrated program. And just to go back to that last point, so we have decided to focus within the procurement space on something called ISO 2400. Uh, has maybe another show of hands who, who has heard of ISO 2400 in the room? So again, very strong kind of response there. So for us, that was a fantastic platform. The reason was, um, again, we're a global business. 
And what that allowed us to do is have a global kind of approach that would work just as well in Australia as it would in North America or Canada. So that, that worked really well for us. And it was a recognised kind of um, process and platform that we could use for ourselves. So that was important. And our non-slavery approach is very much nested within the ISO 2400 uh, principles and, and within our, our work in that area. And that's important because um, often the work that you do in this space, uh, you know, it's modern slavery could be a leading indicator or indicator of a much bigger problem or other issues that may exist. So uh, it is important to have a holistic view when you do this work. It's important to have a hearts and minds approach so people understand why you're doing this and why this is so important. Um, and the other thing that's been really important for us is we've kept it as practical as possible. This is a complex problem, we get that, but we've tried to keep it practical because Again, to get cut through and to get uh, um, ownership of the business, if we, if, the, if we make this overly complex, um, then it may actually not get the cut through and buy-in, at, at the initial stages anyway. So uh, I guess we've taken a tiered approach. So there's a, a smaller group of people that have got um, more work in this area and they're more heavily invested in, and doing more complex work. When we engage with the wider business community across Transurban, and we're still, again, very early in that piece, We've tried to keep the language simple, keep the, the message very practical, and, uh, and tried to do a bit of the heavy lifting for our business owners first, so that when we go and talk to them, we kind of talk to them in, in a language that they understand. So a simple example is when we do our risk mapping, uh, a few people talked earlier about risk mapping, we didn't go off and create a beautiful risk map that was great on its own, but didn't translate into the business's kind of uh, operational language. So we actually used the Transurban Enterprise Risk Framework and then kind of converted that and worked backwards from there. So it's a language that people understand. People actually get this is, this is what you're talking about. You don't have to teach them about modern slavery and a new risk framework at the same time. You kind of have to keep it simple and practical. And then the last thing I'll just kind of add is the collaboration piece. And adding on to Frankie's comments, we just see this as fundamentally critical to the success of this program. We have to work together in partnership um, with the wider industry and to that extent, um, well, it's been a fairly recent development. Again, we're not as advanced as the PCA has been in this space, but uh, we've, we've been working uh, and, and, and part of a <coughs> coalition for the road sector uh, with ISCA, which has been fantastic. We've only just kicked that off, but it's a great first step and another sign of how collaboration can make a real difference. And uh, everything you talked about before applies equally to the road sector. So that's just been kind of the couple of first steps for Transurban. And um, we, we very seriously understand that we've got a long way to go, and this is a... This is a, a long road ahead without perhaps a clear answer to all the questions that uh, everyone may have in their heads here today, but we have to work through it together. Thank you, Deepan. Mons, for you, a question um, that came up, which was followed by a, a fairly um, useful description of the cleaning sector's journey, uh, was that if you are going to create um, impact, you need to use the influence of investors or owners. So I'm quite keen to hear your perspective on that particular comment and how that's playing out for you as representing <laughs> the investor sector today. Yes, I guess for a, from an investor perspective, the Modern Slavery Act affects us in two ways. Obviously, um, the, the companies we, 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 we invest in, but also as a reporting entity ourselves. And maybe to take a step back on the importance of this from investors as well, I think Sure, you can look at this as a purely ethical issue on slavery, but I think ultimately you need to take it back to your own investment philosophy. So Osbill is um, an active funds management firm based here in Sydney. We mainly invest in Australian equities. And we, we believe that earnings drive share prices. We want to invest in companies with sustainable earnings and companies with management quality or quality management. So I think there's a natural link between that and, uh, and, and, and the topic we're talking about. Obviously, on earnings revisions, well, brands are key assets. They can be quite vulnerable, quite time-consuming and costly to restore once they've been damaged. But to me, the key, the key point, I think, comes back to earnings sustainability. So if a company has a business model or a supply chain that relies on underpaid workers, weak regulation, or even illegal activities like slavery to produce current earnings, I don't think those earnings are going to be sustainable for, for, for the long term. And while we investors often talk about earnings, um, I think it's not just about earnings either. I think it's, uh, it's also a bit of a proxy for management quality. So if, if you invest in a company and you realise they have no idea where they're sourcing from, you know, as an investor, you, you do think, what else should I worry about? And I think that's a really important point. And we integrate ESG, uh, so environmental, social and governance, in our investment decisions. 
And the reason why we do that is to make better informed investment decisions. That's really what it comes down to. And I, I envisage investors will use the Modern Slavery Act <coughs> statements once they come out. It's a bit like we use TCFD statements on climate change. It's a basis for further discussion. That's really what it is. Um, and, and we appreciate it's going to be a journey, and it's going to be a journey for us too. Um, and that, that comes to my second point, which is we're also going to report against the Modern Slavery Act ourselves. We also have stakeholders that we are accountable for. So we need to know, we need to know the risk and what companies are doing in, in the companies we're, we're, we're investing in. And I think as investors, we, we'll need to take a risk-based approach. We can't possibly know exactly what's going on in the supply chain of every company we invest in. That goes without si saying. But we will probably focus on where we think the key risks are. And then use our leverage and influence, coming back to your question, I think that, that's a really important topic for us. Um, we are ac we're active owners, and we want to understand the risk we are, we're facing in our, in, in our supply chain, if I might may I call it that, the, the investment portfolios. And in terms of what makes a good statement then for a company that we invest in, I think ultimately we want to see that the company understands its supply chain. That, that's, really, that's really a key for us. And again, it's going to be a journey. We don't think, uh, risk, like, like you were saying before, risk mapping is a pretty big exercise and it's going to take time. Ultimately, we also want to see that companies are doing what they can to mitigate that risk. And I think maybe we should broaden out this scope here a bit as well. I think if you spend the time and money to, to map out your supply chain, there's a fixed cost involved in that. And if you only focus on modern slavery, well, maybe you're missing out on quite a few other ESG risks as well. So I think there's scope to, to broaden it out and kind of kill two birds in one stone. Because um, I think sometimes there is a very fine line between what's modern slavery on the one hand, by definition, and just poor labour practices. Um, my, my biggest fear, I guess, <laughs> is that um, there will be a lot of companies and investors too who take this from a pure compliance perspective. What, what do we need to do to kind of tick, tick the box and, and really comply with this legislation and maybe create a goldmine for, for lawyers? And that, that's not really what we want here. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the ultimate, ultimate question is why are we doing this? Are we doing this because we have to or are we doing this because we want to understand our supply chain? And the same thing goes for us uh, as investors. And coming back to engagement, yes, I, I think that's a really key point. Um, Investors integrate ESG for two reasons, better informed investment decisions, but also active ownership. And I think investors have a big role to play here.